Welcome to the Maven Project's education session on headaches with Dr. J. Cho. Dr. Cho is a retired Permanente Medical Group neurologist with over 30 years of experience in general neurology and vascular neurology. Throughout her career with Santa Carla Kaiser Medical Center, she enjoyed teaching residents both in the out patient clinical settings, as well as the inpatient neurology consult service. She was the clinical lead for the Northern California Kaiser Permanente Clinical Practice Guidelines for Strokes. She was also involved in developing Kaiser Permanente Telestroke Program, which provided emergent evaluation of acute stroke patients for possible treatment of thrombiotic, thrombolytics and thrombectomy. Dr. Choi, you may begin presenting whenever you're ready. Great, thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to share my slides here. Uh, give me one second. All right, I think we're set now, right? It says diagnosis of primary headache disorder. Yep. Okay, excellent, thank you. So um, no financial disclosures. So today we're gonna to talk about two things, how to diagnose migraines, tension type headaches and cluster headaches, and also to learn the red flags. When do I worry that this is more than just a headache, that the patient needs further workup because there is a concern that there's something else bad causing the headache. So those are the two things that we're going to focus on because, um, it's really too much to talk about treatment options and, um, and other things. I do have slides for um, going over why somebody gets migraines, uh, which is really all, um, all, which is always a fascinating topic. And it really helps for you to understand that because um, when you tell your patients, you know, as scary and as painful these headaches are, they're called migraines. The patients almost always want to know why. And that's just, you know, I've never had a patient who don't go on and say, well, why do I get them, you know? And it's really good for you to have a good understanding of what, why people get migraines and to come up with a little script that you use in your own or words adapted for the patient population that you see to explain in the words that they can understand the headaches, because then they will also be much, mess, much, much less demanding on getting further workup done. Um, so um, first, I want to start out by asking you how many of you feel really comfortable diagnosing um, these conditions. And I want to try taking a poll because there are way too many people for me. I was kind of hoping I can just ask people to raise their hands, but I think there are way too many people. So let's do a poll. OK. Uh, use a scale. Uh, one is I don't feel comfortable at all. Two is comfortable, maybe about quarter of the time. Three is comfortable about half the time, 75% of the time. Um, and it will help me to, you know, we can then discuss whether um, how much time to spend on diagnosing versus, um, for example, the red flags or why people get migraines or even the treatment options. So first poll, migraines and tension type headaches. Um, Sharice, do you want to just go ahead and do the polling and do all that? Sure. Okay. Okay, um, so I think that's. Yep, so uh, that's pretty full. That's that's complete 10 out of 12. Okay, so let's do the next one. Um, okay. How do I get to the second question? The set we're going to just relaunch the second one. Okay, and this one is how comfortable are you with cluster tension type headaches? Okay. 
Okay, so the last one is how comfortable are you with cluster headaches? Okay, all right, well, great. Um, excellent. Um, the, most of you seem to feel pretty comfortable, uh, not all fours, but mostly twos and threes, okay? Um, so, um, so, you know, like everything else, you always start with the history and exam. And I think that um, with you guys are very experienced and pretty comfortable. So I'll point out actually just kind of one thing about some of these um, elements in the history that are really important for you to, um, you know, for you to pay a particular attention to. Uh, as you know, you know, examining, a taking a history is really just listening and then just kind of every time you hear something that your ear should just kind of perk up, right? And say, hmm, this is something I need to pursue a little bit more. So when you're talking to somebody who's telling you about their headaches, their headaches, when did it start? And how did it start is really important. As to the age, you know, one rule is that when somebody says, I never used to get headaches, but I started getting headaches, just like I'm old and I'm just started getting headaches, you know? Around age of 50 or 60, always concerning for a brain tumor because brain tumors are much, much more common as you get older. Okay. Any recent change in the headache pattern? Um, location, we call it side locked. The headache is always on one side. Okay. It never switches back and forth. It's certainly a lot more concerning than a headache that goes back and forth at different times. Talk about thunderclap headaches, which is headaches that just go from what I say from zero, you know, from zero to 100 miles per hour in one minute. Boom, you're fine, and boom, just like a thunderclap, you have a headache. Um, it's always nice to know whether the patient's having some aura, flashing lights, zigzag lines, they feel nauseated and very sensitive to noise and smell in particular. Uh, is very um, pathognomonic or very specific for migraines. And, uh, and then you ask about what, uh, what other things happen, you know? If it's really it, headaches that are focused around the eye, especially with tearing and redness, those are always really worrisome. And of course, people tell you that I get a headache when I, whenever I go up to the mountains or whenever the cloudy weather sets in. Those are much, much less concerning because brain tumors, aneurysms, what have you, they would, I mean, those headaches would never really vary depending on the weather, right? Um, headaches that change with the position. Headaches get better when they lie down or headaches get worse with lying down. That's always a red flag, okay? Past medical history, of course, you need to keep in mind the family history and so on. Let me talk about neurologic exam next. What I talk about is a, what I try to tell all uh, primary care physicians is try to get to get your two minute neuro exam down um, and, um, and try to practice this. So it's just like second hands, just like riding a bicycle for you. And the key too is, um, to having, having that neuro two minute neuro exam down is always at the beginning, it's just like learning anything else. You need to have a system, okay? And so you wanna think about, okay, mental status, cranial nerves, motor sensory, cerebellar reflexes, Babinski's and gait. Okay, so those are the elements that you wanna to try to think about. And a lot of times I'll skip the sensory part because it takes a lot of time and you know, a, really it's not as important unless you're, the patient's comp, you know, complaint is, is, a sense, is of sensory nature. And really what I tell people is talk to the patient, watch the patient and remember to walk the patient. So much can be gathered just doing those three. You're talking to the patient, 
So you're really checking the mental status, okay? Um, you're watching the patient. So you're watching their eyes move. You're watching where the face is symmetrical or not symmetrical, okay? So you've already done the, the cranial nerves. All you have to do um, when you start the exam is just kind of go like this see and say, can you see I'm moving my hands? Where do you see them, left, right, or both? Then you're pretty much done, except for the fundi part, which we'll talk about next. And then I ask them to stand up. And as I see, watch them stand up, I can see how they're, and, and take their shoes off. So I can see how they are with their, with their dexterity as they take their sh uh, shoes off. I see how they get up. Do they have to push off and try a few times or do they just stand right up, okay? Um, and then I ask them to walk, okay? And just, you know, walk a few steps. And you can tell whether their arms are swinging, uh, is one arm down and the other one is moving well. Are they dragging their legs? Are they taking tiny little steps like Parkinson's patients? Um, it's, and I ask while they're standing, I ask them to, I mean, I don't do this if somebody's 80, 90 years old, but I ask them to close their eyes and, and you know, stand, close your eyes, touch your nose, okay? Or touch my finger, okay? And young people, I'll even ask them to just, while they're standing, okay, raise their foot, touch the shin of the other leg and go up and down, down you know, the uh, knee to the ankle, up and down, okay? Or half on each foot, you know, if they're young and those are kind of things, are, those are kind of uh, elements of physical exam that are, that are important. Now, how many of you um, uh, have used the pen optic? Can we have a quick poll? You want option one to be yes? Yeah, yeah yes, what, be I'm no. sorry, correct. Okay, so option one is yes and option two is Great, great. So um, about half and half, okay. Um, for those of you who haven't used it, this is a good investment to make because it really allows you to see the disc. It is so easy. So it's an, an investment worth making. So um, there's actually, uh, what we, the International Criteria for Headache Disorders, ICHD. There's actually criteria for making the diagnosis of migraines, tension type headaches, and all other primary headache disorders. There's an International Headache Society that actually meets just like uh, DSM-3, DSM-4. They meet regularly to fine tune the criteria. And it's not that I think you should memorize these criteria but I want you to just be aware that there are these criteria, and that if you're not certain whether somebody's having a migraine or not, it can actually be helpful for you to just pull them up and see whether they meet the criteria or not, okay? I'm gonna go over this, uh, uh, move through these slides a little bit quickly because um, I kind of go over the same points over and over just to drive home the important things that you need to learn. And by the way, if you have any questions or concerns, um, uh, you know, just or just discussion points, just raise your uh, raise your hand or post them in the chat box. I would really like uh, this talk to be more interactive. So, the cluster headaches. This is the one that most people are a little bit uncomfortable with. So let's start with what the. Uh, ICHD criteria is, and, um, uh, and I'll just also add just a, a few sentences that are really important to keep in mind when you're making the diagnosis of cluster headaches. So uh, criteria says that you have to have at least five attacks of severe unilateral pain, okay? Um, around the eye, above the eye, in this area, in this quadrant, basically. 
usually lasts to 15 to 100, three, hour, uh, three hours. It's very short. You know, migraines tend to last a lot longer. I mean, 180 minutes with cluster headaches is, is, is no, uh, uh, is, is, is really hell. I mean, that's really painful, okay? But, you know, compared to migraines, it's a lot shorter. Either or both of at least one of the following, okay? And these symptoms are on the same side as the headache. Conjunctival injection. So the eye, the white around the eye looks red. That eye cries, not the other eye, but just that eye. So it's like you have the headache on, the, on one side. So if it's on my left side, it's just the left eye that's red, that's crying. Left nostril is congested and it's runny. The eye is swollen, okay? And there's sweating, okay? And there is the eye is small and it may even droop like a Horner syndrome. This is really, I should have uh, made this last point, restlessness and agitation um, in red um, or, or bold. This is actually quite classic and just about everyone has it. Um, it's not uncommon for me to hear from uh, patients that uh, when they have a headache, just to think about a migraine patient. Migraine patient, they are, you know, in a dark room, the lights are out, the curtains are drawn, they have the sheets over them, they're all curled up, they don't want to do anything. It's like, just leave me alone and go away. Cluster headache patients, they are very restless, they can't stay still. They're moving, they, one patient, he would just, I don't know whether it helped or not, but he thought it helped. He stick his head under a faucet and just have the water running. Uh, another patient I know, he was always punching the wall because the pain is so severe or there's actually neuro neuroanatomical basis for this restless agitation behavior when you look at the uh, uh, um, pathophysiology of why people get migraines, uh, cluster headaches. Um, it's, uh, it has to do with parts of the brain that get activated when you have cluster headaches. They actually cannot stay still, okay, when they have cluster headaches. Dr. Cho, we have a question from okay. Brooke. She asks, is there a certain time frame that the attacks need to happen within to make the diagnosis? Repeat that again. So is there a certain time frame that the attacks need to happen within to make the diagnosis? So is there a time frame? Oh, oh are there, the, I think the question is, is, is there a certain time of the day that the headaches uh, tend to occur more often? Or Brooke, if you want to unmute yourself, feel free to do so. Just to get more clarification, if you want. Is, is there like a time frame? Like, do these ne attacks need to happen with Uh, so they, they tend to occur. The, the oh, sorry, Brick, you, you went, your uh, mic was muted when you were in the middle of posing your question. I'm sorry. sorry. Can can was, no, no worries. <laughs> you can, uh, sorry. Okay. Question, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, is there a certain time frame? Like, do they need to happen within um, so many months of each other or within a year in order to diagnose with cluster or migraine or tension? Oh, I see. Um, no, no. Um, so migraines, I get migraines and my migraines can be, um, when I was younger, I had them fairly often. Now I get them every so many years. Uh, so migraines, definitely not. Tension headaches tend to, um, tend to occur more often, but much milder, but certainly no, no, no time period in between. The cluster headaches, they can come in a cluster. They can have uh, often, they're more often during the night. And a lot of times people will say it's like an alarm clock. You know, it's certain time, like I wake up at two in the morning and I'll, I'll almost always get them, okay? Cluster headaches tend to come two to three times a day. And some people will say, you know, I, I always get them starting in the fall. I'll get it for a month and it'll go away but there's no, it's not part of the criteria that they have to occur uh, within a certain uh, amount of time from the last attack. Does that answer your question? 
Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chung. Okay. So I'm not sure why I can't pick it. There we go. So um so that's a lot to really keep in your head, right? What we're trying to do is we're trying to come up with um, uh, with, with this, uh, kind of a simpler system in our head, you know, so that you can at least kind of say, ah, this sounds like a migraine. And if you're not sure, then you can go to the ICHD, International Criteria, and then you can do the double check. But, you know, you just kind of get a, get a sense, is this a migraine or not? Okay. Um, so there is this thing called the PIN criteria, okay? And with the PIN criteria, the question becomes in the last three months, okay? Did you have headaches that made you sensitive to light? Okay, photophobia, okay? I'm gonna try to see if I can get a, uh, oh, there we go, okay. Now I got a pen to draw with. Photophobia, did light bother you when you have a headache than when you don't have a headache, okay? Um, incapacity. Were you not able to do something or you did it, but you were at 50% your capacity? Nausea, did you, you know, did it make you sick to your stomach? You don't have to have thrown up, but did, did it kind of make you sick to your stomach? If people say that with their headaches, okay, it was yes to at least two out of three of those questions, the diagnosis is very likely a migraine. This was reviewed in, in, among you know, in 5,800 patients, that's a lot of patients. And the sensitivity and specificity were pretty high. So that's another way to think, think about it. That's why they're called sick headaches, right? Migraines, you know, they make you sick to your stomach. They make you not able to function because the physical activity makes your headache worse and does it make you sick to your stomach. So that's kind of another easy way to look at, think about it. Um, so the, Hmm. Ryan, can I make those um, drawings, go, uh, the lines go away or do they, are they going to stay? There should be an eraser icon under the same tab you found the pen and that would just let you delete them. Okay. All right. Well, I don't, I don't think I'll use that if I have to keep doing that. Okay. So we talked about how to diagnose them. Now, you know, along come, it's, it's the same thing, it, it, two sides of the coin, you know, you think it's a migraine, but you're still a little bit worried, okay? Um, now, to become more and more confident in making the right decision there, that this is a primary headache disorder, i.e., I don't need to worry about it other than just treat the headache, or this is possibly a worrisome headache, okay? You need to know both sides of the coin. So secondary headaches. When do I need to worry about them? The red, the red flags. Okay. Let me get rid of these as well. All right. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not actually a big person. Uh, I'm not big on acronyms, but um, I know some people are. There's one called SNOOP6, okay? And depending on how many P's you have, some people call it SNOOP4, SNOOP10, okay? And um, so what are the th components of SNOOP6? Systemic symptoms like fever, weight loss, secondary risk factors, they, they, they have some systemic symptoms or risk factors for having infections or metastatic cancer, you know, you're, uh, you should have a lower threshold for worrying about bad things. Neurologic symptoms and signs changes, especially in vision. When we talk about vision, actually, you know, even when we're talking about other neurologic symptoms, we talk about negative symptoms and positive symptoms. Let's take a quick, uh, um, I just want to know, do you know what I mean when I talk about negative symptoms versus positive symptoms? Yes for uh, one and no for two. Can you, we just do a quick poll? So option one is yes and option two is no. Okay, great. But, uh, so how about um, I 
Let's have some participation. Tell me about, give me an example of positive symptoms. Just unmute yourself and talk. Blurry vision. Okay. Anyone else? A positive symptom could be something like nausea, something that is is present where it wasn't before. Okay, great. So, um, yeah, I think, you know, I'm glad I asked because um, it's something that neurologists use, but I don't think many other specialties do. Or So um, let me clarify that a little bit. Uh, neuro when I say positive, when a neurologist says positive symptom, it's like flashing light, zigzag lines, or twitching like a seizure, okay? pins and needles, when we talk about, so the other side of it is negative. What is a negative symptom? Negative symptom is like loss of vision, okay? So if I say I can't see anything, then I'm thinking that's a negative symptom. And then I'll ask, well, do you see any flashing lights or zigzag lines or like, you know, uh, floaters or like, Christmas, you know, uh, uh, snowflakes or when you, so those are like almost hallucinatory quite things, right? Okay, so positive symptom is a presence of a symptom that suggests that the brain is actually uh, turned on. It's, it's got like, it's, it's activated beyond what it should be. Negative symptom is the brain has actually lost the function. So if I, my arm is shaking, that's a positive symptom. If my arm is paralyzed, that's a negative symptom, okay? So if I lost, if I can't see or my, my, eye, my vision is all grayed out, that's actually a negative symptom. But if I say along with that, I see flashing lights and zigzag lines and you know, things like that, then that's a positive symptom. If I'm numb, that's a negative symptom because I lost the sensation. But if I have a pins and needles going on, then that's a positive symptom. Is that clear? Yes, no? I can only see two participants, Trey and Brooke. <laughs> yes, no? Okay, great, okay. So the Trey. reason I talk about that is um, when, um, uh, just as a, a general rule of thumb, if somebody has a positive symptom, you worry more about, um, if it's like flashing lights and zigzag lines, more about a migraine, okay? Uh, or a seizure or an epileptic phenomenon. If they have a loss of vision, then you think about a stroke. So people with, uh, with a stroke won't come in and tell you they have flashing lights and zigzag lines or tell you that their hand is shaking and twitching away or that they're having um, the pins and needles. It's a little less common, but still the stroke patients will acutely, they will come in and say they're numb, not they're having pins and needles. Um, so that was a bit of a digression there, okay? The onset. Um, uh, you know, the snoop, O is the onset, that it, the headache peaks in one minute, that's the thunderclap headache. Again, we talked about the onset of the, after age 50 because the brain tumors are much more common at that point. Um, we talked about change um, in, uh, from the previous change in headache frequency and things like that. Usually when somebody who has a, um, Somebody who says, you know, I used, yeah, I always got headaches, but it used to be, you know, once a month and then became once a week. And then it became almost every day. Almost always the reason for that is what we call this medication overuse headache. Okay. And the concept for medication overuse headache is that the medications, the pain medications that they're using, whether it be it a sumatriptan or maxalt or what have you, 
or Excedrin, okay, or Tylenol, the medicine is actually making their headaches worse, okay? And this is where understanding the pathophysiology of why somebody gets headaches is really helpful. What I tell my patients is that it's almost like there is a headache generator inside your head. Okay, there are, and it's been shown with the PET studies and everything. Um, so there is a, think of a bunch of brain cells deep in your head that, that are actually known as headache generator. They, they cause, when they turn on, they cause a migraine, okay? And the pain medications that you use, like Excedrin or any of the triptans or Tylenol, any pain medicine that you use, they don't actually work on the headache generator to turn off. They work to turn off the downstream effect of the headache generator being turned on. The headache gener generator turns on. What happens? What are the downstream effects? They cause dilation of blood vessels on the scalp. They cause painful nerve endings to get all excited and cause pain, okay? So when you take your Excedrin, it turns the downstream effects, it gets rid of the pain, but it, what it actually does, it's like so many things in the, in the brain, it has, a, it, has a neg, it has a feedback loop, okay? So the, the, the headache generator and the pain, um, pain nerve endings on your head, they're talking to each other, okay? This turns on, this turns on, okay? And when you take painkillers, actually the feedback loop, it goes back and turns this up, okay? So it's like, so what you end up doing is when you take Excedrin every single day, you're just actually turning this thing on, the headache gener on and on and on. And it actually, that's why you get into a medication overuse headache. And what I tell people is that you need to break this cycle. You can't keep taking this pain medicine because every time you take it, you get a short relief, okay? Your, your pain goes away, but what you're doing is you're making your long, it, this primary problem actually worse. I usually tell people it's like a bad credit card, okay? You, you know, it's like a bad credit card. You pay off your bill, uh, uh, your, you pay off, get your gasoline, get your groceries or whatever. But what it's doing is you're making your, your the monthly credit card bill that accrues 25% interest, you're making that worse. Okay. So, so with, with the um, medication overuse, is it, I know you mentioned sumatriptans that can mm -hmm. do that. And then Excedrin or, um, and then I've obviously heard NSAIDs. Is there mm -hmm. anything else that you, are those the main ones that you oh, see? Oh, they all do it. Okay. They all do it. The worst ones are Excedrin, caffeine, Caffeine containing compounds, they're the worst. Okay. And narcotics, those two are the worst offenders. The NSAIDs don't tend to do it as much. Okay. But triptans definitely do. Yeah. And the rule that we tell people to use is no more than two days out of a week. Now, that number is variable depending on, on the person and on the medicine, but, you know, two days a week. Okay. So um, I think maybe what I'll do is um, just write into the chat box if you would like to spend uh, more time um, going over the medication overuse headaches or going over the pathophysiology because you'll be getting these slides so you can look at these actually if you want. Um, so right into the chat box in the remaining time, if you would like to go over the medication um, rebound, uh, the medication overuse headaches and uh, pathophysiology um, of migraines and skip over some of this. But let's do this here, this poll again, which patient worries you the most? And we're also getting some feedback that um, provider would like to see the, the medication over the medication review, sorry. Overuse headaches, okay. Okay, great. All right. OK. 
Okay, so that's pretty good. So, um, so tell me what, again, I just want this to be open. So um, let's everybody unmute, okay? Um, tell me what is worrisome about the first one? What worried you? This was the worst headache she ever experienced. Okay, how about those of you who thought that it's actually the second patient? Um, tell me what was reassuring about the first patient. The nausea and the photophobia. The aura. Yes, absolutely. You guys are right. So first patient, you know, when people say it's the worst headache ever, of course, the, in my mind, I worry a little bit. I asked him about, well, how long did it take to get there? That's really important, you know, or I just woke up with a headache, then they don't know. But this, the part about the, the sensitivity to light and sound and smell, when somebody tells me they're sensitive to smell, that's actually highly, uh, it, it has a high correlation with it being a migraine, okay? A sick to the stomach, the R, yeah, absolutely. So the first one doesn't worry me so much, even though it's the worst headache. I'll probably delve into what she means by the worst headache, okay? But that patient doesn't worry me so much. The second patient, tell me um, what about that patient uh, was worrisome to you? What, tell me the, the people who, who selected number two. The memory issues, wouldn't that be like a negative symptom that you were just talking about? Yeah, that's, yeah, that, I'd be worried about that. Yeah, what else? New onset after age 50 and that right? it's kind of more, more or less constant. That's right, that's right. Even though that person says, I used to get sick headaches as a child, this doesn't sound like a sick headache, right? Okay, it doesn't, he doesn't, you know, it, I, so I would, I would, that I, I'm worried about the two. No one selected three, okay? And uh, that was just a fun headache. And there, there's actually this thing called hypnic headache where people wake up. It's not a cluster headache. They just wake up at uh, the, the kind of the same time every day. And, and uh, the, there's no, you know, it's a primary headache. There's no underlying cause. Um, so what I'm going to do is um, uh, talk about some of this pretty quickly. Um, I'm going to actually switch over to, um, give me one second. Uh, yeah, OK, so um, this of you, because can you guys read this pretty well still? It looks, um, yeah, we could still read it. Okay, great, because it will help me figure out which slides I need to move to pr okay. pretty quickly. Um, so, uh, and just point out some things. Um, so the, these are the things I wanted to go over before we talk about the, uh, the migraine medication overuse headaches. Um, so a couple of the myths that I wanted to make sure that everybody um, heard um, is that Many people have both types, migraine and tension type headaches, okay? And studies have shown that really those are really pretty much um, all migraines. Um, a lot of people think that tension type headaches are much more common, and that is true. They're actually more common, but they're much, much milder, and they don't really come to see you with oh, just a mild tension type headache. So most of the headaches, studies have shown that most of the headaches that doctors see, most of the headaches that patients seek medical care for, they're almost always migraines, okay? And the headaches that, um, you know, when they tell you, it, it sounds like they're tension type headaches, um, inevitably they also have migraines, okay? And the question is, studies have shown, there are a lot of studies that show that, remember that I talked about that headache generator? So it depends how that turns on. It's almost like a, uh, if it turns on just a little bit, then it's a little headache and that's more like a tension type headache. And when that turns on more, okay, and then it becomes a migraine. They've done studies like, um, you know, uh, well, this one particular study, 
when they, even though the headache seemed like it might be a tension tight headache because it didn't have the nausea, the flashing lights and zigzag lines, when they took the trip tents, they all went away. And they have neuroimaging studies that validated all this. So just the key point is that a lot of people have both types of headaches, they're all migraines. And um, most of the headaches that you're gonna see are migraines. Sinus headaches, okay? A lot of people will come and say, oh, doc, just give me a course of like antibiotics because ah, I get this all the time, sinus headaches, okay? They're actually pretty uncommon, okay? Studies have, nasal symptoms are actually not all, all, not all uncommon in migraines. And one study looked at two, almost 3,000 patients, okay? And either the patients diagnosed themselves as having sinus headaches or doctors did. Okay. And they all had no prior history of migraines. Okay. But when they went back and like really drilled down the history better and 90% uh, of them actually, they fulfilled the criteria for migraine. Okay. So before you decide that somebody has a sinus headache, really think twice is a key point. Um, so medication rebound headaches, it's also other people call it medication overuse headaches and rebound headaches and drug induced headaches, medication misuse headaches. Um, you know, I kind of, I used to like the old term better, better analgesic rebound headaches because to me it, it kind of, it was a descriptive term that patients seem to understand uh, better. And I don't like the new term as much because I feel like it's being a bit judgmental. Patients kind of go, mm, I'm not overusing it. I'm using it only when I have to, you know? Um, so anyway, um, it's actually pretty common. About 2% of the patients have it world, 2% uh, uh, incidence uh, prevalence worldwide. And um, most of the worst headache patients like you're just pulling your hair out. You don't know what to do because there are patients have headaches all the time. Almost always they have, I mean, 80, 90% of them are going to have medication overuse headaches. Okay. And the ICE, the international headache criteria for it is greater than for three months, headache days more than half, you know, for, so the quick, the question I ask is in the, in the last three months, did you have headaches about 50% of the time? And if they say yes, then I ask about the use of the pain medications. And the way I ask is, you know, I always try to preface, I know you don't take pain medications unless you really have to. Okay, you take them only because you have to take them. I understand that, okay? But just to, you know, just so I understand as your doctor, so I can make you better, I need to know how often you take your pain medications. Is it pretty much every time you have a headache? If the answer is yes, then they have medication overuse headaches, okay? So like I said, it's more than two days. It's any pain medications, any abortives including simple analgesics that you get over the counter. Like I said, oh, furanol. I don't see people on furanol anymore, but that used to be really common. It was the worst offender because furanol and furacet, they have butalbital, which is a long acting phenobarbital kind of a, a, it's a barbitrate. It has caffeine, okay? They were the worst. Okay. So we have a question. Okay. Um, from uh, one of our volunteer physicians, uh, the timing of prodromal symptoms relative to onset of headaches. Can okay. You go a little bit more into that. Sure. Um, so you know, it used to be that you know people thought about this, right? Um, the phases of a migraine attack. Um, Premonitory, this is, uh, it's kind of like people say, oh, they, they feel like they're gonna get something, okay? And, um, and then you actually have the aura, you know, flashing lights, zigzag lines, tingling, whatnot. You have the headache 
And then afterwards, post drum, you feel kind of yucky, you feel exhausted. Um, now, the aura, the so the prim, I, I'm pretty sure that probably what was uh, the premonitory symptoms, it's probably the aura the, that you were asking about. The aura can come before the headache, after the headache, or completely independent. And for some reason, it's not uncommon for somebody to hit their 50s, um, mid, midlife, late life, and the, the aura comes by itself, even without a headache. Thank you, Dr. Cho. Okay. Um, so going back to the uh, medication overuse headaches, okay. Um, so, uh, you know, it, sometimes it's really hard to get the history um, of the uh, medication overuse headaches. And I think part of it is that a lot of people don't consider medications they get over the counter as abortive medications. Kind of they think of as only the prescription medicines as medicines, anything, you know. So when do you suspect medication overuse headaches? When patients say that the headache has been getting worse and worse and worse over time, that medicines help, but they all stop working, okay? Or they don't help for very long, okay? Or a headache is present and they, you know, uh, they tend to occur in the morning, okay? Talked about that a little bit, okay? Um, so Midas questionnaire. This is actually a really good one to use. Sometimes I just... You know, I, I use it for a couple, um, for, uh, for uh, two purposes. One is at the very beginning to get a sense for like, you know, unless somebody tells me I get migraine once a month, what do I do? But I have a patient who's telling me they get a lot of headaches and just, you know, I'm just trying to get a sense. And they're telling me about all kinds of things, you know, and I just want a synopsis. I want to get a, like a, a, a synopsis of what the patient's headache is like then I'll just throw this out and just ask them to fill it out. And it just pretty much asks last three months, okay, how many days did you miss work or school because you had a bad headache? How many days in the last three months did you go to work or go to school, but you couldn't do the work? Okay, how many days in the last three months could you not do the housework because of your headaches, okay? How many days in the last three months you could do the housework, but you, know, you weren't really functioning? And how many days in the last three months did you miss your family? So, it, and the score should total to, it shouldn't be higher than 90, okay? You know, so you don't double dip, right? You missed school and, and you didn't do housework. Well, I mean, you don't give a score to number one and four, so. So when, when I, so I, I, I will use this at the very beginning, okay? And then I'll use it in follow-up just as, as kind of needed. Because if I have a patient who started with a score of you know, 50, okay, and I feel like we're making some progress, but the patient is, um, is not too sure, then I'll just pull this out and say, fill this out. And then you know, I'll have a sense of how they're doing. Uh, do, do you want to talk about the how to get rid of uh, medication overuse headaches a little bit, I imagine? Well, we have about seven minutes left if you want to do a quick overview and then we can open it up to questions. Okay, great. Or okay. If anybody has any questions, feel free to add it to the chat box. Okay. So this is a picture of, um, of the brain here. Okay. And I kind of remember talked about the headache generator and how it's causing downstream effects. So this is the dura, the, you know, the covering of the brain. This, uh, this, and you can think also you can put scalp there as well. So this gets activated, goes out, inflames the blood vessels and nerve endings, causes pain. It has this feedback loop. This is what I was talking about. This is the PET scan, okay? It talk, this is the headache generator. I tell my, I always show my patients this picture and I say, think about this red dot. When you take your Excedrin, this red dot gets hotter, okay? And whatever, if you have headaches a lot, what you wanna do is you wanna focus on turning that red dot off is what I tell my patients. 
Um, so, um, I thought I had a slide about the, the way to turn, basically the way to get somebody out of medication overuse headaches is to educate the patient really well so they understand what's going on, okay? And then tell them that um, you have two approaches. One is you stop taking the pain medicines. That's really hard to do. Um, imagine, you know, if you've been taking Excedrin two, three days, five days, seven days a week, it's going to be incredibly hard for you to just suddenly stop, okay? And uh, so I say, you know, one way that I, I say there's the, you know, there's the hard way and then there is like really, really difficult way. The really, really difficult way is we do nothing, but you stop taking everything, including caffeine. And after three months, I can guarantee you, you will be better because studies have shown over and over that doing nothing, but just stopping those things, patients get better more than 50%. That's the really difficult way. The hard way is I start you on a preventive medicine, okay? And um, the, we kind of do this thing where I, I ramp up on the preventive medicines, you go down on your pain medicines and we'll come up with like a schedule. Instead of taking pain medications, five days a week, you will take it four days a week, you'll take it three days a week, we come up with a schedule, and I'm ramping up on the preventive medicine. And then after about a month or six weeks, I've reached where I want to be with the prevent with the preventive medicine, I started them on um, Topomex, or amitriptyline, let's say amitriptyline, they're, you know, at 50 milligrams, 75 milligrams a day, okay. And the pain medicines, they're down to using it a couple days, three days a week. And then I tell them to stop. It takes six weeks. I tell people studies have shown that it takes six weeks to turn that thing off. Okay. And it's just a lot of support while they're doing this. So, yeah, let's open up for, for questions at this point. Perfect. Yeah, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to unmute yourselves. I know this could probably be an oversimplification, but do you see any difference um, in terms of um, headache prevalence between genders? Certain types of headaches are more common in males versus females. Oh, absolutely. Um, so uh, migraines, for sure, more common. So if you look at um, the graph that shows age, uh, um, um, age down here and the incidence of headaches and a separate graph for men and, you know, for male and separate graph for females, until puberty, it, it, it's pretty much the same between boys and girls, okay? But after puberty, um, the women have a whole lot, females have a whole lot more migraines than men, okay? And then again, around menopause, late life, okay? The women start to have, you know, migraines are less common and then they start to meet again. Tension type headaches, it's more or less even. Um, and cluster headaches tend to be more men. Thank you, Dr. Cho. Um, any any more questions? All right, I think that's it. Thank you, Dr. Cho, for sharing your expertise today. Um, just so everyone knows, Dr. Cho is available on VC for consults. Please feel free to reach out to her if you have any questions. Um, for the